Over my lifetime, since 1973, we have had 12 new Supreme Court justices. And through all 12 of their confirmation hearings in the Senate, we have had precisely one argument about what all of those Supreme Court appointments would mean. Every time, every single time, we have talked about any personnel change on the Supreme Court since Roe versus Wade. Every nomination was described as the determining factor in whether or not Roe v. Wade would be overturned or if it would survive. The constitutional right to have an abortion in this country was established by Roe in 1973. It has not been overturned yet. But when Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito was confirmed by the Senate on January 31st, 2006, that long predicted hyperbolic assertion that the nomination of this one conservative justice could be the end of abortion rights, when Samuel Alito was confirmed, that perennial high volume, all caps, worry slash warning started to come true. When Samuel Alito joined the Supreme Court, in effect replacing Sandra Day O'Connor, the constitutional right to have an abortion in this country started to disappear. And I mean that in one very specific way. At the end of this legislative year in the states, abortion rights could be over in a way that Roe versus Wade was supposed to protect against in this much of the country. This is a map of states where restrictions on abortion that are in all likelihood illegal under Roe versus Wade have been at least introduced in the state legislature. In these states, those laws have either passed one or both houses of the legislature or been signed into law by the governor. This specific legislation was first passed in Nebraska after Kansas abortion provider Dr. George Tiller was murdered, the Nebraska legislature soon thereafter passed a bill intended to drive out of business the second most well-known abortion provider in the country, Dr. Leroy Carhart. More than just trying to make it impossible for Dr. Carhart to provide abortions in Nebraska, though, this bill was designed really to end all abortion rights nationwide. With Samuel Alito on the Supreme Court, the National Right to Life Committee helped to draft the Nebraska legislation so that one state would have, as its state law, a restriction on abortion that is exactly the kind of thing that is banned by Roe versus Wade. So they set up, on purpose, a specific kind of conflict between the state and the federal law. Federal law on Roe versus Wade says you cannot restrict abortion in this way. The Nebraska bill is designed to break that federal law. Why do that? So that people who want to protect abortion rights will challenge that law. It'll go to federal court. They think because of the way they wrote it, it will go all the way to the Supreme Court, and it will then serve as the vehicle for the Supreme Court, including the new probably anti-abortion majority, thank you, Sam Alito, to overturn Roe versus Wade once and for all. After Nebraska passed their bill last year, it was expected that that pro-choice challenge to that bill would happen. So far, it has not. Abortion rights advocates can read the terrain the same way that anti-abortion folks can. They know exactly where that legal challenge would end up as well. But meanwhile, meanwhile th this year, state legislatures have turned deep red all across the country. And more anti-abortion legislation has moved than in any other time since Roe versus Wade. The right to get an abortion is being more restricted this year by Republican-led state legislatures than it ever has been since women have had the right in this country. 14 other states have introduced some version of the Nebraska law. Bills that ban abortion after 20 or 22 weeks, ban it outright. Is that legal? Is that constitutional? Under everybody's reading of Roe, no it is not. Are those state laws being struck down as unconstitutional? No. The constitutional protections of Roe versus Wade are supposed to stop laws like this from happening. But by necessity, as a means of trying to protect Roe from being overturned altogether, the pro-choice movement has apparently so far made the calculated decision to let it slide. A bill in Ohio this session would restrict abortion not to 20 or 22 weeks, but to as early as five or six weeks, which basically means that as soon as you realize you've missed your first period, your abortion is illegal. Potential Republican presidential candidates have already started to endorse that bill in Ohio. And it's not just Ohio. Lawmakers in six other states introduced bills this session that would ban most or even just all abortions. That is supposed to be unconstitutional under Roe versus Wade. But if nobody will sue over those laws, because looking up at that Supreme Court, they know what's going to happen if they do, then quietly and with no real national debate, Roe versus Wade has already been effectively overturned. I understand how this has happened, but I do not understand how this ends. Joining us now for the interview is Terry O'Neill. She's president of the National Organization for Women. Ms. O'Neill, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let's just call it, uh, for simpl simplicity's sake, the Nebraska bill, even though now it's been proposed in 14 other states. D does the Nebraska bill seem like, at a basic level, 
Roe versus Wade is supposed to stop states from passing laws like that? Absolutely. Roe versus Wade uh, establishes that it is a woman's fundamental constitutional right to choose to terminate a pregnancy um, if she wants to. Uh, and and uh, after Roe versus Wade was really substantially changed, actually, in southeastern uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, in that case that Sandra Day O'Connor authored, still the, the dividing line was viability. And under Casey, um, a state cannot outlaw abortion pre-viability. Um, uh, just can't do it. Uh, Post-viability, the state can outlaw abortion, but under Casey, the state would still have to provide exemptions for such things as to protect the woman's health or her life um, or in, in, in other circumstances. So, so when the Nebraska bill, which outlaws abortion at 20 weeks, clearly pre-viability, that is a law that I think is clearly intended to set up a challenge to Roe versus Wade at the Supreme Court level. It's totally unconstitutional. We've also got this, the, the five or six week bill in Ohio. We've got uh, other, six other states, I think, trying to ban it in some various ways. Some of these states just to ban it outright altogether. Uh, so far, none of those measures have passed yet. They very easily could, looking at the makeup of those legislatures. Looking at bills like that, that, that you don't even need as much of an explanation as you just gave to say that they would be unconstitutional. They're just prima facie unconstitutional given Roe. Is, do we have to understand that the only way to call upon the protections of Roe versus Wade is to bring lawsuits that challenge state laws that violate it? You know, I, the, the problem with bringing a lawsuit in federal court to challenge these uh, to challenge these state laws is exactly what you said. We're we're afraid that the Supreme Court actually might take the opportunity to overturn Roe versus Wade. This is a court that is led by John Roberts. He's a man who frankly misled the United States Senate during his uh, confirmation hearings. He talked about how he thought that being a Supreme Court justice would make would mean that he needs to be an umpire, just calling the balls and strikes, you know, not putting his thumb on the scale. And then under Roberts' leadership, the Supreme Court reached out in the Citizens United case to actually address an issue that had not been presented to the court. And in Citizens United, they reach out, they take an issue that was not presented to the court, and they open the floodgates for corporations to, to basically buy um, elections. So this is a court that is extremely activist when it wants to, be, wants to be, and I'm really afraid that under Robert's leadership and with Samuel Alito on the court, we could have a five to four decision either overturning Roe versus Wade or so gutting it that it might as well be overturned. And I, 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 in trying to figure out what's happening with this just tidal wave of anti-abortion legislation in the states, so much of it that just seems plainly unconstitutional, plainly against what Roe v. Wade is supposed to protect against, I have been trying to figure out where this ends. If that fear that you're describing, that any, any federal court challenge will result in Roe v. Wade being overturned, then let's say Ohio passes this bill that bans abortion after five weeks. Does it just, is it just, does it just become law? Is it just left to stand? Is there any way to see how this ends other than that? Well, you know, if it's not challenged, then yeah, the law does stand. Unless you can take it to court and get it, get a, a, a preliminary injunction uh, or an injunction against the enforcement of it, yeah, the law would stand. And here's the thing: this 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 hostility to women's abortion rights doesn't stop with abortion. What we're seeing across the board really is hostility to women's reproductive health care rights. We just had a fight in which in which uh, the, the extremists in the House of Representatives and in, in and in Congress tried to cut off funding, all funding, for family planning clinics that serve more than five million women and men every year, right? These are family planning clinics that don't provide abortions, that provide contraception, pap tests, mammograms, STD testing and treatment, HIV AIDS um, uh, testing. What's happening is that, that as abortion, as anti-abortion laws gain more and more traction, um, we're also seeing attacks on all the other aspects of women's reproductive health. Um, it, it, and frankly, a, a defunding the, the family planning clinics is a public health nightmare in the making, but, but we're seeing these attacks across the board on our reproductive health rights. Terry O'Neill, president of the National Organization for Women. Um, thank you. I, I sort of feel like I've been screaming into the wind on this a little bit because I don't feel like it's getting a lot of national attention, but you've really helped me understand it better. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. We'll be right back.